Okay, so the title of today's talk is A Digital Analysis of the Medieval Vaults at Wells Cathedral. My name is Nick Webb and I'm a lecturer at the Liverpool School of Architecture and my research looks at the use of digital tools to investigate historic works of architecture. And I'm joined by Dr Alex Buchanan, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of History, also at the University of Liverpool. And Alex's research is at the intersection of architectural history and archives, and she's previously carried out some research into medieval vaults. So today we'll discuss our findings in relation to vaulting. These are arch ceiling constructions, usually made of stone, sometimes made of wood, particularly at Wells Cathedral. So our collaboration began in 2014 after uh, academic matchmaking via a colleague and Alex and I were joined by J.R. Peterson, who's a senior technician in the School of Histories, Languages and Cultures. And quite early on, we received funding from the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art in order to produce a digital survey of the medieval vaults at Wells Cathedral. And at this time, this was April 2015, we, we travelled down to Wells and we produced a black and white digital survey. Uh, and that was of the East End interior. We chose black and white because we were still not confident about file sizes. So we, we erred on the side of caution and, and went for black and white. And we therefore returned to Wells in October 2019 to scan more of the interior. And this time it was all done in colour. So. Our analysis of the data that we collected at Wells is central to our research as well as our upcoming book and you'll see this hopefully in today's talk. In 2018 we received a grant of nearly a quarter of a million pounds from the Arts and Humanities Research Council and that allowed us to expand the project considerably and as part of that funding we employed Dr James Hilson and Dr Sarah Duffy uh, as part of the project team and it also facilitated today's talk and the follow-on workshop. So here you can see a map of all of our sites and the fact that in the list Wells was very early on. Uh, we began with a, a pilot study at Chester Cathedral and then Wells was our first major site. So why are we studying Volks? Well in 1841 Professor Robert Willis he gave a lecture to the newly established Institute of British Architects later to become the Royal Institute of British Architects. And in this talk, he outlined his theories on how vaults were designed and constructed. And he based his findings mainly on accessible vaults, such as cloisters, which are relatively low to ground level, as well as destroyed vaulting, such as parts of Canterbury Cathedral. So I've just highlighted now the left-hand image, which shows the elevation of the East Cloister at Norwich. Uh, and this has vaults that are about four metres above floor level to the apex. And these were therefore accessible to, to Willis via a stepladder or similar. You can see here as well the inclusion of people for scale. Many vaults are much higher than those in the cloister at Norwich. For example, in the choir aisles at Wells, they're approximately eight and a half metres high. And, and these will be central to our talk today. Moving on to higher vaults, such as those in the nave at Exeter, which are approximately 20 metres high. And the highest still that we found are in the lantern at Ely, which are a whopping 44 metres high. Many vaults were therefore inaccessible to Willis, and he used his talk to the Royal Institute of British Architects as a call for more data. So the idea was that if architects uh, were to erect scaffolding uh, on these structures, if they're carrying out work, could they give their data to, to Willis? Uh, he had little success though, uh, except for Charles Barry. We also need to think about the accuracy of this previous scholarship, because when surveys did take place, they were done using analog techniques. 180 years later, so present day, we still don't fully understand how medieval, medieval vaults were designed and constructed. However, digital surveying methods allow us to capture these fascinating architectural elements quickly and accurately. I'll now hand over to Alex. Thanks, Nick. So I'll talk a little bit about the background of Wells Cathedral. The Bishopric of Wells was founded in 909, but in 1090 its seat was moved to Bath and thereafter shifted between Bath, Wells and Glastonbury until Wells regained cathedral status in 1245. Possibly as part of this project, the 
church was rebuilt by Bishop Robert in the mid-12th century. But soon after 1174, a new project, project was initiated to replace the entire structure on a grander scale, working from east to west in the usual way, but with archaeological evidence of breaks in construction and not complete until the glorious west front, as she's shown in the slide, was finished in the 1240s. A cathedral required a chapter house, but the dating of this structure, this two-storey tiercer and vaulted structure is disputed, but it was almost certainly complete by 1307. The magnificent centralised Lady Chapel was begun thereafter, but it's again variously dated. Scholarly consensus currently supports the dating of around 1323 to 26. The retro choir and the flanking chapels are associated with documented dates of 1329 for the South Chapel and 1331 for the North Chapel, with the retro choir probably complete by 1333 when the former east wall was taken down. The presbytery, with its net vault, probably dates from the late 1330s. There's some complexity in the side aisles where there are no documented dates, but the stained glass of the southwest choir aisles is said to be the earliest, dating from around the 1320s. The famous strainer arches in the crossing may be William Joy's work and they relate to subsidence in the crossing tower. Stained glass in the transept suggests that the north transept was being worked on earlier than the south, after which work be began on the cloister. There are also two Masons identified as architects working at Wells. Thomas the Mason, named in a document of 1323 and therefore associated with work on the Lady Chapel, shown in green, has been identified as Thomas of Whitney, named at the same time as working at Exeter Cathedral, where the fabric rolls suggest he died in around 1342. William Joy, whom I've already mentioned, is named as Mason in 1329, and he's associated with the presbytery, particularly the clerestory and the high vault. Joy also worked at Exeter, where the fabric rolls suggest that he died in around 1347, possibly in the Black Death pandemic. We therefore wanted to know what our data could add to understanding of the church. So, for example, we wanted to know whether our data could add to our understanding of the chronology and the sequence of construction. We wanted to know how were these highly original vaults worked out in two and three dimensions? How do they relate to other 13th and 14th century vaults in England and continental Europe? And how were the designs translated into worked stone? But first, we needed to decide how we would capture the data we needed to answer these questions. And I'll hand back to Nick for this. So we, we tried three different methods and I'll talk through those before going into detail about the one which we decided on and how we then used it in our work. So the first of the three is called total station. And the way that it works is you look through a lens and guided by a laser, you pick a point in three dimensional space press the side of the total station and it records that point as an XYZ coordinate. And you do this several times over to record uh, details of the interior that you require. And what you get is something like you see in the middle image here. Hopefully you can see my cursor. So this is almost like a dot to dot plan of one of the vault bays, uh, in this case at Chester Cathedral. So what are the advantages of total station? Well, the data is precise and it's selected. Uh, so you're only recording what's required. At the same time though, this can be seen as a disadvantage because if you want to re record other elements of the vault, then uh, you need to produce more points or do separate campaigns. Another disadvantage is the scanning times. They're very long. So it takes one or two hours, uh, somewhere between that number uh, to scan individual bays. And it's also pretty painful as Alex and I found out uh, doing it over several hours. Uh, another advantage, the points aren't in color. And obviously we're only getting individual points and they're quite sparse. So at this stage, we abandon total station as one of our methods. That's not to say it isn't useful, uh, but it, it wasn't quite right for us. So the next method that we tested was laser scanning. And the way that this works is the scanner records the distance between it and every surface that it hits 
just like the total station, but this time it does it hundreds of thousands of times over. And you're not selecting the points that it hits, it's just collecting all the information that it sees. So once it spins around and collects all those points, it spins around again and takes a series of photographs. And this then allows the scanner to assign color to each of the individual points. So what we get at the end of this is what we call a point cloud model. And the best analogy we've come up with is it's a bit like a swarm of bees, but shaped like the interior of a building. So what are the advantages of laser scanning? Well, the data again is very precise and all details are recorded of the vaults as well as the wider interiors. So even though in our project, we're looking primarily at the vaulting above, the scanner's also collecting data for the elevations, the floor and any other architectural elements. Another advantage is that the process is relatively fast, so it takes between 10 and 30 minutes to produce each scan, depending on the resolution and the quality that we require. Disadvantages, very large files, so you need a pretty powerful computer to do anything with the data. Similarly, another disadvantage is that the software and hardware are, are, are quite expensive, so it takes a spe specialist company or a specialist project like ours to be able to carry it out. So once we have this data, we can export it as an ortho photo. And this is where perspectives removed to create an orthographic plan or section. And you can see an orthographic plan of Chester in the center here. We can also export the information as mesh models. And mesh models are where the points are joined together to form triangulated surfaces. And I'll explain that in more detail uh, in a few slides time. But just to flick back now between total station and laser scanning, hopefully you can therefore see the difference between the two. So the third and final method that we tested was photogrammetry. Photogrammetry works by taking hundreds of photos of the target you're trying to capture, and you do this from as many different angles as possible. And you can see here, this is JR, and he's working in one of the choir aisles at Wells, and he's being carefully watched by the cathedral cat. So once we have all of the photos, these are imported into a piece of software called Agisoft Metashape. And the software is able to process those photographs and figure out their position in three-dimensional space. And from this, it's able to build up a full 3D model. And from the model, it produces a point cloud. So in the same, much the same as a laser scan. And likewise, you can export as a mesh model. So the advantage of photogrammetry is that it's inexpensive. So you can use a personal digital camera, even a smartphone, and the software itself is uh, about 500 pounds. Another advantage, the quality of the images that it generates is excellent. A disadvantage, however, is the quality of the mesh and the point cloud models. Um, we had some issues with that, and I'll explain those in, in the next couple of slides. So here you can see, this is some initial data that we produced using the laser scanner. And this is in the Lady Chapel at Exeter. So when we analyzed this data, we were quite happy with the geometry that was coming out of this, but the image itself was a little bit grainy. And here's the photogrammetry equivalent of it. Uh, geometry, we were quite satisfied with it again at this level. Uh, and the quality of the image here is far superior than that produced in laser scanning. So then we started to look at the details. So we first looked at a profile of a column. So cutting through a column using the point cloud data, both from laser scanning and photogrammetry. And this was at a low level, so approximately one meter above uh, floor level. So you can see the results for both. They're pretty comparable. We're getting good results for both laser scanning and photogrammetry here. The main reason for this is that the photographs that were taken and the laser scanner are relatively close to the target. But on this slide, we start to see how photogrammetry breaks down. So if we look at the first two images on the left, we can see with the laser scan version, so cutting through a rib high up, approximately 10 meters away, um, we've still got a pretty good recording of that rib profile. Whereas the photogrammetry version, we lose all of that detail. And again, the main reason for this is we can't get close enough with a camera to get uh, good photographs. So 
From this point onwards, we decided to use laser scanning as our primary method. And here's a quick video that shows. Oh, I didn't want to play. There we go. Got there in the end. Um, so this is the laser scanner. Let's start, I'll start that again. It was not happy. There we go. Um, a time lapse video and you can see the laser scanner is spinning very, very slowly here at Lincoln. And as part of that process, it's recording all the surfaces that it hits as points. And I have the difficult job of making sure that no one trips over the tripod. OK, so the next thing we have to do once we've got the scan data is register it. So the scanner works on line of sight. So you need to take many scans in order to build up the required information for the entire interior. And you can see here, this is the North Quiet Isle at Wells, and we've shown the point cloud using different colours. So you can see, for example, the pink point cloud on the very end down here, uh, that's overlapping into the next bay. And the red bay here, you can see overlapping into the next. So uh, data across the different bays uh, allows us to build up a better picture of what's going on. And the way that the scanning software knows that uh, the scans are aligned is by using targets. So we put up spheres, which look like giant ping pong balls and the scanner software can see those big ping pong balls and it works out where they are in space and then uh, puts those scans together. More recently, it doesn't even need to do that. It can just identify pieces of geometry within the, uh, the scanner and um, align them automatically. So, this is our plan of wells, and this shows you every scan that we took. So we produced almost 100 scans on our return visit to wells. And you can see here, we, we focused on the cloister and the east end of the cathedral. We, we didn't produce that many uh, in the west end and the crossing. And here are some initial outputs. So these are the ortho photos. So on the top, we see a plan view looking up at the vaults above. And to the bottom, we see a long section through the entire cathedral. And the other output that we get is the mesh model. So we tend to take mesh models for individual bays. Uh, you can see this, our data is uploaded onto Sketchfab, which is a bit like YouTube, but for digital models. So I'm just zooming in here so that you can see the underlying mesh, so the triangulation. So if we zoom in close enough, hopefully you can just about see all of those triangles. So once we have that data, what do we do with it? Well, one of the first things that we do is we trace along the intradus line of all of the ribs. The intradus line is the outermost edge of a vault rib, and it's critical in understanding each rib's geometry. Wooden centering would have been used. So this is an image on the bottom right of some centering. So this would have been used to create the design of the required curvatures and geometry. You place that up uh, to where the vault is being constructed, and then you build the stone over the top of that centering. So this is critical because the stone would have sat on that timber centering uh, while the, the mortar was setting, and then you knock out the centering and hope that the stonework remains in place. So studying this intradus line, as I said, is, is really critical for our work. And in a previous talk, we had some questions about centering, and I thought this was a good image to try and highlight what it looks like in situ. So Notre Dame, obviously, because of the fire and they weren't too sure about the, the structure. So they shored up the buttressing using some timber centering. I think it's quite a beautiful image just to see timber centering in place in a medieval building. And here you can see this is uh, one of the choir aisles at Wells and you can see the image in the centre. This is where we've traced along the intradus line of all the ribs and you can see how we've also projected 2D images out from that. So I'll just talk through some of the key geometry that we're looking for once we've traced those ribs. The first thing that we do is we run a best fit arc through that traced curve uh, because the trace curve itself isn't a true piece of geometry. So we create a best fit arc and then we're looking for the impost 
And this is the point on which the springing point of a rib appears to rest. And it's usually the abacus of a capital in medieval vault. So you can see the impost here running along the bottom. We also have the springing point. This is the lowest level of the rib where it departs from the underlying support. And it's almost always a fixed point. We also have the notional apex. This is the highest level of the rib and it's usually covered by a boss. And we use the 3D modeling software so we can work out where this notional point is by extending the arcs beyond the boss stone. Obviously we have the radius as well. And finally, we have the center point of this arc and this position we need to work out how it sits in relation to the impost. So in this example, it's sitting directly on the impost. But at some examples that you'll see later in the talk, it can sit either above or below. So I'll conclude this section just by showing you a video of us manually tracing uh, a rib. This case is uh, Ely Cathedral in the North Quiet Isle. Uh, and in, in this instance, we're doing it manually. So you can see we're going in and we're creating points along the intradus line of the rib. And more recently, we do this automatically. So we create an automatic section cut through that rib. Uh, sometimes we get more difficult ribs, which snake along, and then we're back to this manual uh, tracing process. So that rib has just been traced. Blue Peter moment. Here's several we did earlier. Uh, so here you can see all of the rest that have been traced. So the next step is we highlight the points that we've traced on that rib. So there you can see the points. And now we run a circle through that it's called a circle through points. So the software is building a circle through the points. And you can see it's done that now as a purple circle. So the next thing that we do is we start to tidy the model up. So the green line, which is the impost, which has now been highlighted and is therefore in yellow, is used to trim that circle below. So we've now got an arc. And at the notional apex point, we then trim it again. So another pre-prepared moment, we've got all of the other ribs that have got best fit arcs running through them. And the next step is that we start to extract the geometry that's required for our research. So I'm now asking the software to tell us what the radius is of this rib. And it's about three and a half meters. So we then go into a very large Excel spreadsheet containing all of the data and we add it to that. And next we're looking for the center of this arc in relation to the impost line. And you can see this has been recorded at about 0.85 meters beneath the impost level. And then finally, we go back into the software and we record the apex height. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of how we capture the data and how we begin to compile it for geometry. So I'll now hand back to Alex. Thanks, Nick. So before we look at our, a bit more about our findings at Wells, let's look at the anatomy of our vault so we all know what we're looking at. A Gothic vault has two main elements, the webs and the ribs. The webs or the surface of the vault were usually constructed from coarse masonry and plastered. In the Middle Ages, the webs would usually have been decorated with frescoes, as we still find in Italy, remains of which survive in some English vaults, such as those at Lincoln Cathedral shown on the slide. The ribs are the mouldings which usually mark the changes in plane of the webs, but they could also decorate planar surfaces. The ribs were first built as a framework and the webs were after, added afterwards, but both elements are equally important to the stability of the vault, Medieval vaults are not like modern steel frameworks infilled with non-load bearing panels. If you could cut a section through a vault, as we can do in a ruined vault, such as that at Melrose Abbey in Scotland, you'd be able to identify the stages of its construction. After the ribs and webs were erected, the pockets behind the bundles of ribs were filled in and the whole structure was usually coated with a layer of a concrete-like substance. The starting point of a rib is called its springing, 
and the top is called the apex. At the apex, where a rib meets another rib, there's usually a sculpted boss. The bosses at Lincoln are stunning and they merit careful examination. We've also done a full survey of all the bosses at Wells. Architectural historians have given ribs different names based on their location. The wall rib marks the junction with the wall and the transverse ribs span between the side walls, marking the division between bays. A bay is what we call a compartment of vaulting. Diagonal ribs cross the bay diagonally and ridge ribs run, run along the crown of the vault, either east-west, the longitudinal ridge rib, or north-south, the transverse ridge rib. Additional ribs, which spring from the corners of the bays and rise towards the ridges, are called tiserons. And those which don't start at the corner of the bay, but start from another rib, are called liurns. At Wells, we have both tiseron vaults, in the retroquire and also Leon vaults. We're mainly going to be looking at the Leon vaults today. We believe from our research overall that medieval architects started to design a vault by creating a plan of the ribs in two dimensions. This was laid out full scale, full scale on a flat plaster surface called a tracing floor. Very few of these tracing floors survive, although they are recorded in building accounts. And we've been lucky enough to be allowed to scan the tracing floor at Wells Cathedral. That was the main reason for our return visit in October 2019. From our data, we can create absolutely accurate two dimensional representations of the vault from which we can start to hypothesize the process used to draw out the plan on the tracing floor. We know that the drawing tools available to medieval designers were limited. Their main tool was a set of compasses or dividers from which they could create curves. They also had squares for creating angles and straight edges for drawing straight lines. So any design process we suggest has to be possible using only these basic technologies. In our workshop, we'll show you in more detail how to use these basic tools to lay out a medieval vault. So what we're sharing now is just a quick taster. Although our research isn't primarily about the geometry of ground plans and elevations, it's worth pointing out that at some sites, like Wells, we think that the original 12th century plan, including the transept and the two westernmost bays of the side aisles, was laid out on a modular system, which continued to be used in the 14th century eastern extensions you can see on the slide. The same modules are found in different combinations in the 12th century transept and further east. Perhaps not surprisingly, as the 14th century builders retained the first two bays of the Eastern Arm. They possibly also used existing foundations, so this reuse of modules may tell us something about the planning of the earlier East End. The presence of modules is significant because what we found at most of our sites is that vaults seem to have been laid out using a proportional system rather than measurements. In practical terms, we can easily see why this might have been the case because in many buildings there were significant variations in bay sizes, meaning that any measured system would soon break down, whereas dividing a bay proportionally allows the same design to be used regardless of dimensions. The design tool we think architects may have used to divide a bay into proportions is what's been termed the star cut. This can be created easily using dividers and can be used to divide a bay into any fractions up to one hundredths. The star cut could be used to divide a bay into thirds, as in the crazy vault at Lincoln, sixths, as in the southwestern bays of the choir aisles at Wells, and ninths, as in the high vaults of the choir and nave at Exeter. We also find fifths, as in the crazy vault at Lincoln, sevenths in the East Transept chapels at Wells, and thirteenths, as in the Lady Chapel at Ely. Although we think in this case, the 13ths are a coincidental product of joining other points derived from the star cut, rather than a deliberate intention from the outset. Although the star cut isn't the only device for creating such proportions, we think it's the most likely, both because other tools which have been proposed are less practicable, and because we've also found variants of the star cut in use, both at Wells and at other sites. Whilst these don't have the advantage of creating fractional divisions of the bay, if this wasn't a requirement, they're just as useful for transferring a design concept across different size bays, and are just as easy, if not easier, to produce using dividers. 
The apparent use of systems fundamentally similar to the star cut seem to make its use more likely than another different way of creating proportional divisions. If you come to our workshop in three weeks time, we'll be showing in more detail how the star cut was used to lay out the vaults of the South Choir Isles at Wells. Once we've identified and tested our hypotheses for the two-dimensional plan of a vault, we then try to identify the processes used to establish its three-dimensional form. In post-medieval vaults, the three-dimensional form of a vault is generally determined in advance, and the ribs are projected onto it using stereometric methods. By contrast, in medieval vaults, the three-dimensional form is a consequence of the curvature selected for the ribs. This had been the hypothesis formed by Robert Willis back in 1841, which our research has been able to test. Since Willis's date, it has been suggested that medieval vaulting followed a trajectory towards standardization of rib curvatures, with the normative rib being a semicircular diagonal. This, however, has not been our finding. Instead, we found that most vaults have ribs with a range of curvatures, which we believe were selected using a range of basic geometrical processes. Excluding ribs with more than one arc, these processes can be classified as following a chord method or a fixed radius method, which we'll explain. In order to investigate the rib curvatures, we create tables of measurements created from the wireframe models. The key measurements, as Nick's explained, are the height of the springing point, the height of the apex of the vault, the radius of each rib, and the distance of the centre of the arc from the impost level. In general, our findings suggest that medieval architects considered that an arch should ideally have its centre or centres on the level of the impost line, discussed by Nick, and therefore if any rib has this property, it may be generative. Architects seem to have proceeded from fixed points upon which the choice of method for selecting rib curvatures depended. The vaults in the lower levels of the East End at Wells all have arcs with a single centre. If we look first at the height of the centres of these arcs in relation to the impost level, we can see that there are some patterns. In the 12th century quadripartite vaults of the pre-existing transept, the diagonal ribs have their centres at impost level, as do all the ribs in the western three bays of the South Choir Isle, and most of the ribs in the equivalent bays of the North Isle, all shown in turquoise on the slide. Elsewhere, the wall arches have this feature, but it's otherwise more sporadic. Let's next look at the height of the apexes of the ribs where we can see a somewhat similar pattern. The apex of the diagonal ribs of the transepts, shown as purple dots, seem to have informed the heights of the wall arches and central bosses of the western bays of both side aisles, and some heights in the bays further east, but on the south side only. As the three western bays of the side aisles on both sides retained the arcades of the 12th century church, it's perhaps not surprising that their vaults were in part shaped by the pre-existing dimensions. When we start to look at the radii of the arcs of the ribs, a rather different picture emerges. Here we see that the majority of the radii in the eastern bays are within a similar range, shown in green, to those used in the 12th century transept vaults whereas those further west are not. This observation inevitably leads to the question of how the radii were established. What came first? The answer is not surprisingly, it depends. When deciding how to turn a two-dimensional plan into a three-dimensional vault, we believe that a medieval designer identified what points he wanted to regard as fixed. Although informed by the pre-existing architecture, this was a choice made by the designer probably with an understanding of the effect these decisions would have on the architectural outcome. In most cases, the springing point was a given, the abacus of the capital, and the impost level was determined by the springing point, although it could be disregarded. The apex could be fixed by reference to pre-existing heights, but usually offered a range of possibilities, provided wall arches rose higher than pre-existing window heads, and nothing rose higher than could be accommodated by any pre-existing or intended roof. It was also possible to regard the radius as fixed, enabling the reuse of any bevels or templates used to determine the curvature of a rib. In the Retrochoir and Eastern Bays of the South Isle at Wells, 
it appears that the designer regarded the radius, shown in green in the plan top left, as a fixed element, perhaps taking it from the pre-existing vault ribs. In most of the retro choir and the eastern bays of the north choir aisle, the apex heights were also standardised, shown as red dots in the lower plan, producing level ridges, which in the retro choir were covered with a ridge rib. If the radius and the apex height of a rib are fixed, the only variable is the location of the centre, which could be found what, what with what we've, using what we've termed the three circles method. Firstly, a circle with the known radius is drawn with its centre on the springing point, the blue cross in the left-hand diagram. Next, a second circle of the same radius is drawn with its centre on the apex, shown as a green cross. Finally, a third circle, again with the same radius, is drawn with both the previous centres on its circumference, enabling the centre of the arc, shown as a red cross, to be identified. And you can see here it's lower than the impost level. If the radius is not fixed, another method for identifying the location of an unknown centre is what we've termed the two chord method. This is fact based on the principle that the radius and centre of a circle can be found when three points on that circle's circumference are known. We've not found this method used in this way at Wells, although the principle may have informed the method used in the high vault of the choir. In the western bays of the south choir aisle, all the ribs have their centres at the impost level, as shown in the top left hand plan. As shown in the second plan down, the radii are all the same. But these radii don't appear to have been copied from elsewhere in the building, so they were probably not a fixed point. More likely to have been fixed are the apex heights of the wall ribs shown in the third plan, which seem to have derived from the height of the central boss of the transept chapel vaults, or the apex of the transverse ribs, which is the same as the heights of most of the wall ribs in the transept chapels. For such ribs, where the level of the centre and the apex are known, the radius can be found by means of what we've called the chord method, in which a line is drawn between the springing point and the known apex. If a second line is drawn as a perpendicular bisector of the first line, the point at which it intersects with the impost line is the centre, and the radius is the distance between this and the springing point, or this and the apex. Standardising the curvatures throughout the vault had advantages in terms of stone cutting, allowing any voussoir to be used for any rib. In these bays, the tiercerins have their centre on the impost and use the same radius as the bounding ribs. The unknown point here is the apex height, which could be discovered with what we called the two circles method. Here the starting point is the plan of the vault. A circle with a fixed radius is drawn with its centre at the springing point. The intersection between the circumference of this circle and the impost line becomes the centre for a second circle with the same radius, which represents the curvature of the rib. Its apex is found by drawing a perpendicular upwards from the end of the rib on the plan until it intersects with the second circle. Fixing the radius rather than the height here results in a vault whose centre is higher than the transverse arches. The Bombay form had initially identified as being different from the level ridges of the northeastern bay, and this was what started our research in the very first place. Once we've hypothesized the process for deriving the three dimensional form of the vault, we compare the hypothetical model with the traced model to check their congruence, and here we're pretty happy with what we found. Now I'll now hand back to Nick, who'll look in more detail at what our methods can tell us about stone cutting. OK, so we'll now look in detail about the possible stone cutting process used for the vaults at Wells, as Alex says. So vaults presented complex stone cutting requirements, particularly when compared to simpler components such as rectangular blocks to make up a wall. The shape of each rib starts with a two dimensional moulding profile that is extruded along a two dimensional curvature and elevation, the geometry of which was discussed in detail by Alex. This results in a three-dimensional arc that is divided into three types of stones. So we can see here at the top, we have the boss at the apex, and then we have the individual voussoirs. Uh, so these are the individual stones making up the rib. And at the bottom, we have the tadachage 
blocks and this often comes in two different parts. By building digital models of the cutting processes for these different stones within a specific vault, we've been able to test a variety of different methods and see whether or not they allow us to reproduce our scanned data. And this can be demonstrated using the South Choir Isle at Wells Cathedral. So cutting voussoirs was a relatively straightforward process for a medieval mason. So we'll use this as a warm up exercise today. The curvature of the rib could be set out onto a rectangular stone using a template representing the radius of the rib, as well as the angle of the joint using a bevel. The stone would then be cut to fit and a template is used to add a moulding profile on the top and bottom faces. So this is actually shown on the side in this image. With this in place, the mason could then continue by roughing out the design and bringing the stone to completion with fine carving. So this is it, this is your final voussoir. In Choir Isles Bay's S7 to S9 at Wells, all ribs, as Alex stated, have the same radius, therefore cutting the voussoirs would be a relatively straightforward process. So think about it like your standard Lego block. Uh, you've got your standard voussoir here uh, and you can just use it again and again. However, in the Choir Isles Bay's S4 to S6 at Wells, we see a variety of radii used. Therefore, more thought on how to construct the blocks is required. In addition, whereas in S7 to S9, all have their arc centers on the impost line, those in S4 to S6 vary. And this further complicates the stone cutting process, particularly for the Tadashar stones. By comparing the ribs and elevation for S7 to S9 and S4 to S6, these differences become clearer. For the longitudinal wall ribs shown here, S7 to S9 on the left has a blue four meter radius with an arc center on the impost. S4 to S6 shown on the right has a green 3.7 meter radius, again with its arc center on the impost. So moving on to the longitudinal tier syrins. in S7 to S9 on the left, these continue to use the blue four meter radius with the arc center again on the impost. And the same patterns repeated for S4 to S6 using the green 3.7 meter radius with the arc center again on the impost. Crucially on comparing the longitudinal ribs and the longitudinal tier syrins, in their respective bays, both have the same geometric processes except for the different length in plan which consequently changes the apex height based on using the two circle method of geometric construction. So if I just flick back between the two, so you can see here for the first longitudinal rib, you have the length in plan at the bottom for both of them. And based on the diagram at the bottom, uh, if you then change to the next one, because this is a shorter distance using the two circles method, it therefore means that we have a lower apex. Moving on to the transverse tier syrins, the pattern continues for S7 to S9 shown on the left. The only difference is a slightly smaller span in plan, which results in a lower apex height. However, you'll notice that although the green 3.7 meter radius is again used for S4 to S6 on the right, the rib center is now raised above the impost level. This therefore create, creates a slightly stilted rib. It complicates the geometry of S4 to S6 as the ribs position is no longer consistent. We can see this again if we switch between uh, the two tier syrins. So there, if you just see the fact that the rib is kind of moving upwards ever so slightly. Fini finishing with the transverse ribs, the pattern for S7 to S9 shown on the left remains the same. This time we have a slightly larger span in plan resulting in a higher apex. S4 to S6, on the other hand, now has a red 4.5 meter radius and the center of this rib sits just below the impost level. So again, it's an, another rib design entirely. So this, this complicates the process further. However, there is another method that we can use to demonstrate this. And Robert Willis, who we mentioned earlier, uh, he created what was called the middle plan. And here a section cut is taken at approximately half of the height of the vault from the impost to apex. And the points of the rib in plan are recorded at this height. So you can see the dotted line on the left at about half the height of the vault. So the points here where it crosses through the intrados are then joined together. <laughs> 
So this creates a pattern in plan and helps us to distinguish geometries between bays. So focusing on the South Choir Isle, the consistency of geometry can clearly be seen in the middle plans of S7 to S9 on the left, which is semicircular. So the fact that they're all on the impost with the same radius results in this semicircular middle plan. And this is to be expected given that consistent geometry. On the other hand, the irregular rib, rib geometry previously described in S4 to S6 results in a spade-like middle plan, again demonstrating the complexity of these bays. We'll next hypothesize how these two distinct designs were cut as Tadashage stones. Before we do though, note the additional complexity of the Tadashage stone that sits in between bays S6 to S7, as this therefore is the junction between the two designs. This is semicircular to the left and spade-like to the right. We'll return to this added complexity uh, when we end the talk. So we'll now attempt to hypothesize the stone cutting process for the Tadashar stones, starting with the lower and finishing with the upper. In the South Choir at Wells, the Tadashar is divided into two levels, a lower block with a horizontal cut on its upper face and an upper block with radial cuts connecting to the voussoirs above. So you can see here on the lower block, flat stone on the bottom, flat stone on top. With the upper block, we have the flat stone on the bottom, but here where it beds in for the individual voussoirs above, they become radial. Right, so this is the most complex part of the talk. So just bear with us. Uh, so starting uh, with the lower block uh, on the underside of it, we find the corner of the bay by adding a line which represents the wall surface and another representing the center line of the Tadashage, which also acts as a division between two adjacent bays. Next, we add additional lines representing the direction of each rib as drawn in plan, followed by a circle on the bay corner to account for the thickness of the stone uh, to give each rib springing point. So what you're seeing here basically is the corner of one bay and here you've got the corner of another and this circle here allows us to work out where the edge of the stone will be. So we complete the underside by adding the profile for each rib, carefully aligning it to meet the springing point and rib direction. Moving to the top side of the block, we use the lines created on the underside and we transfer them to the top using the sides. So underneath here, we've already drawn out what's required and then we can transfer them up and onto the top. Using rib curves previously drawn in elevation, we can identify the distance between the wall surface and the end of each rib at the top of the block. This distance is shown in the diagram as beta. So here we have here the vertical dotted line, which is the, the wall. And here we have drawn out our rib curvature. And these dotted lines in plan represent the underside of the block and the upper side of the block. So we just need to record that distance there, beta. These distances are transferred to the top of the block to give the edge of each rib. And the rib profiles are added as previously discussed. And here we can note the difference between the two blocks. The design of S7 to S9 is semicircular as expected, whereas in S4 to S6, the profiles move in and out due to the varying radii and arc centers in relation to the impost. So here we have that semicircular design as expected. And on the right, particularly in these ribs here, we can see how it's moving in and out. So the next stage is that we cut away the excess stone to form curved surfaces perpendicular to the entralis line of each rib. And we use bevels to ensure they follow the correct curvatures. On the rear face of the block, we cut away additional stone to form a stalk, allowing the Tadashage block to bond into the wall behind. And as shown for the voussoirs earlier, we rough out the design that's required and then finish it to the required level of detail using the rib profile. We'll now move on to the upper Tadashage block. So first we set out the design on the underside and we can do this by simply transferring what we've already created from the upper side of the lower block. Moving on to the top side of the block, we again use the lines on the side and transfer them up onto the top.
And using rib curvatures previously drawn in elevation, we can again identify the distance between the wall surface and the end of each rib at the top of the block. And this time it's shown as delta. So again, dotted line vertically, dashed line, sorry, uh, that's where the wall sits. Here's our required design for the rib, its curvature. And here's the bottom face now of the upper block, and here's the top face of the upper block. So we simply need to record that distance there, which is delta. Next, we transfer these distances onto the top of the block to give the edge of each rib. Following this, we cut away the excess stone to form the curved surfaces perpendicular to the intradus line of each rib, using bevels to ensure they follow the correct curvatures. You'll notice this is different. We're not adding the rib profiles at the top of the block at this stage. These need to be cut radially before the template is added, because as I said before, we're now at the point where the top of the tadachage uh, sits at the junction to the individual voussoirs. We therefore next identify the starting point for each of the radial uh, cuts, in this case using a semicircle located at the centre point of the top face. And starting with the back of the stone, bevels are used to draw in the radial cut of the first rib at the correct angle, which is then for, uh, cut to form the angled surface for the wall ribs. And then we add the profiles. You can see in this case it's a half profile because it's against the wall. And we repeat this process for all of the ribs. So it's going back and forth with the bevel or bevels and uh, creating that radial cut on the top and then adding the template as required. So to finish the upper block, we again rough out the outer edges of the rib profiles and complete it by cutting away more stone uh, to the required level of detail. Again, the process for S7 to S9 is relatively straightforward given the consistent geometry involved, whereas the multiple curvatures of S4 to S6 increase the complexity of this process. This can be seen in the ortho photo of the Tadashage between bays S5 to S6 shown on the left, as well as our hypothesis for S4 to S6 on the right, where the radial joint on the top face radial joints on the top faces are at different heights as a consequence of the multiple underlying curvatures. On the other hand, the radial joints on the top face for S7 to S9 are all at the same level due to their consistent geometry. So probably just about see that. So here we get these lines representing the radial cuts. And if we look at the end point here, the next one jumps up ever so slightly, then back down. Uh, and you can see that again here in the hypothesis. So this point here, well, if we start with the wall rib, it drops down slightly, then back up again, then back down. Because of the complexities of S4 to S6, we're unsure exactly how the masons would have managed the interactions between these different heights and angles, though it probably involved a similar combination of templates and measurements derived from elevation drawings that were shown previously. So to finish, let's return to the Tadashage of S6 to S7, the very problematic one. And this one sits in between the two basics. The stones appear to have been cut initially according to the same methods as S4 to S6, but when the works were restarted following a new design in the western bays, in the choir aisles as well as most sites, construction tends to move from east to west. The masons were presented with a choice. So the first possibility for them was to keep the existing Tadashage blocks, adjusting the diverging ribs above to adhere to the new design of S7 to S9. So basically what we see is these bays would have been in place, including the entire Tadashage block. So we would have seen this spade-like design probably running through on this side too. So what do we do basically? Um, one option is to, to adjust what goes on above. So we would have continued this spade-like design and then the voussoirs above would have changed their design. And we see this at other sites of investigation. So in the cloister at Norwich, we can see where a bay has changed its design, but the tadashage between them remains the same. A different possibility, therefore, would be to remove the Tadashage blocks entirely and replace them with a custom design straddling both bays, a complex problem which would have been difficult to reconcile geometrically, structurally and constructionally. <laughs> 
The final possibility was to amend the existing block in situ, either by carving more stone away to form the new design or by breaking away elements requiring additional stone and replacing them with new parts. So the final option seems to be the most viable given the material fabric of the vaults. Looking first at the lower block, by overlaying plans derived from S4 to S6 with S6 to S7, it can be seen that three out of the four ribs share a similar plan at this height. The only exception being the longitudinal Tiersen highlighted here. So what's interesting, if we look at this image, we've got the design on the right hand side, the previous one, and you can see all of the uh, details of this rib uh, which are parallel to each other. And on the left, we get the addition of this line here, which doesn't align with the rest of the scheme. So to produce this required design in the new bays to the left, material would therefore need to be removed. Uh, this is supported, as I've said, by the rib itself, which appears to include part of the previous design. Further support for this theory can be seen in the upper block where a mortar joint is in situ, so we get this vertical mortar joint. And this suggests that the previous design to the left was removed by breaking the stone away and replacing it with the new design. So hopefully you can see that this vertical cut here. So it seems like this design would have run all the way round and then the masons would have hacked this bit off essentially uh, to create the new scheme. Note also the higher radial cuts of the ribs in the new S7 bay in comparison to those in S6. So you can see here, these are totally different in terms of what's happening on this side. S6 to S7 demonstrates that the, sorry, S6 to S7 demonstrates the added complexity of designing Tadashar's blocks that straddle bays of different designs, as well as the mason's ability to adapt their stone cutting techniques to fulfill particular demands. I'll now hand back to Alex for some concluding remarks. So to return to our research questions, our data does demonstrate in particular that the side aisles, which were previously considered to be of one build, are in fact four separate campaigns, probably proceeding, as Nick said, from east to west. The star cut and variations of it seem to have been used throughout the East End at Wells. And this is in line with our findings at other sites, as we showed. The consistent use of the two circles method in bays S7 to S9, however, is unique within our research. The use of the same radius creates different apex heights, re re resulting in a distinctly cambered or domical vault. This is similar to Gothic vaults, late, late Gothic vaults in continental Europe, raising the interesting possibility that Wells is a precursor of these designs. Digital methods have enabled us to trail different possibilities for the complex stone cutting problems that would have been encountered and demonstrate the skill of masons in creating these intriguing structures, working with very basic tools. So the next steps of our research, we've just relaunched our website, so do have a look at that. Um, Nick will put the details in the chat. If you want to find out more about our research as it progresses, do subscribe to our biannual newsletter. You can do this by scanning the QR code or following the link in the chat. It's again also available on our website. We've just heard that our book is due for, to appear in the bookshops at the end of next month, um, Digital Analysis of Vaults in English Medieval Architecture. Because Wells has been so central to our research, there's a lot about Wells in the book, um, so we hope that you'll find that interesting. Um, and do look out for our book launch. Um, we've also got a workshop on Wells in three weeks time, so please sign up for that on Eventbrite. Uh, we need you to sign up for that within the next week. So if you're in the UK, we can use your address to post you out worksheets in advance. I'm afraid if you're an international participant, we can't post internationally. But if you're UK, we can we can post out to you. If you're international, we do tell you what you need so you can still participate. We also have feedback forms, which would be really grateful if you could fill in so we can show our funders how our research is, is feeding through to people and hopefully make an argument for more of these types of events. It's a very quick feedback form, which should only take you about five minutes, so please do that. If you can't follow the link, which again Nick will put into chat, um, a copy will be sent to you um, as a follow-up um, from the events team.
We hope you've enjoyed this talk. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs>